Victoria, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear oh, you. Good okay. I just want to make sure. <laughs> I'll turn my, my sound off again. Why did I do this for you? Some groups like to chat before, some just need some oh. silence after the last session. Um, that's a, very <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Nicholas. Nicola, it's good to meet you. Sorry, hi. it's Jody. <laughs> hi, Jody. Hi, Nicola. Hi. Great hi, to meet hi. you both. Likewise. I'm Wonderful. just um, getting ready. I'll join you in the tick. Oh, no problem. Yeah, Jody. No I love your hair. That's <laughs> you have fantastic hair. Oh, that's very kind of you. <laughs> Is everyone enjoying just... the conference so far? Yeah, it's been really good, but good. it feels it feels late. Nicola, are you in you're in Australia right now? Yes, yeah, so it's it's uh, I've only been getting little bits and pieces of it because <laughs> it happens during sleeping hours. But um, yeah, yeah I, I've um, really been enjoying what I have have seen. I, I saw the Black Lives Matter one and the feminist one today. That was good. Wonderful. So we go, uh, okay, go ahead. Um, so what time is it for you then, Nicola? Um, seven, uh, 10 to seven. So it's quite reasonable now. <laughs> yeah, but a few hours ago, wow. <laughs> yeah. Hi, beautiful Liz. <laughs> um, Liz, my beautiful supervisor has come to support me. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Oh, should get the paper actually, that could help. <laughs> I can't seem to figure out how to Hi. mute myself again. Hi, Nicola and everybody. Hi. Sorry, I'm not going to put my video on the chat. We're still waking up here in Australia. <laughs> Oh, I haven't slept, um, Liz, since um, 2 a.m. or something. Uh, so. Have you been engaging in the conference today? Yeah, or? yeah, I have. Yeah, it's wonderful. Fantastic. Real treat. Mm. I'm going to be relying on recordings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's a wiser move. <laughs> But it's so, it is so lovely to um, to witness, if not take part in the conversations afterwards. Mm. You know, yeah, um, it's really lovely. But I guess that it's all going to be taped, isn't it? Including the yep. convos. Hi, Diana. Hi, Diana. Hi, Lisa, Jody, Nicola, Victoria. Hi, Hi. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Me too. So Diana, will you just let me know when I'm supposed to share my um, PowerPoint? Oh, yes, thank you. That's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, right before you begin giving your presentation, because from what I've been okay. hearing, what I've been hearing from other chairs, um, if people come into the meeting after you've done that, they don't see that in the chat, they say? 
Oh. Don't know why, but, or why not, I should say, but. Huh, okay. All right. Yeah, I'll make a note to mention that. All right, thank you. Everyone enjoying the confits? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's amazing how well people know Virginia's work. <laughs> it really blows me away. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was just in the last session that you were in as well. Oh, right. Yeah, they know it inside and out. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And I always learn whole new words that had no idea about, like, haesity and um, what was the one? Hetero. Oh, yes. Heterotopia. Heterotopia and um, another yeah. one. Flip the page. Yeah, heterotopias. <laughs> yeah, and um, chronotope. Is that right? Chronotope time space <laughs> anyway words 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 <laughs> so many <laughs> they're talking about heterotopias and i'm googling what is a heterotopia <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> glad i wasn't the only one <laughs> <laughs> definitely I just a good that. ways to expand knowledge base <laughs> I just love that it's all these ways we're drawing upon whatever wisdom tradition we can to sort of talk about what Wolf is doing, right? So there's yeah. just all these different possible discourses or language out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm glad you said that too, with what's coming up from me. <laughs> Jeez, it's so cold here. Is it cold, Liz, in Brizzy? Um, I'm, I'm near Cincinnati, and today is overcast and kind of a cool day. It's probably low 70s, which is unusual. Right. We're usually in the 90s by now. Right. It's cold in Brisbane, Nicola. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> It's 
putting on another layer. Victoria? Yes. Are you the one admitting people when they show up? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Have you been doing this all day, Victoria? All day. Oh. You totally seem like a pro. <laughs> <laughs> I know. By the end, I'll be like the Zoom queen. I'll know everything. <laughs> Very, very great knowledge to have. Yes, in today's world, it seems like almost a must to have technological knowledge. For sure. Maybe just a couple more minutes. People trickling in from break. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Maybe two minutes. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Diana. Hey, how are you? Good. And hi, everyone else. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know all of you. Hi, Paula. Hi, Paula. I know you. I've, I love your um, ma marginalia. Blogging <laughs> wolf. Blogging wolf. Oh, your blogging wolf. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You did a beautiful piece about the um, Ukraine war. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Still going on. It's hard to believe. Uh, I know. It's crazy. It's totally crazy. Okay. Um, I think we'll get going then. Um, welcome to Wolfine Wisdoms. And um, we'll follow the usual uh 
conference format, which is I will introduce all the uh, presenters at the beginning, and then they will each go in turn as listed in the program, and we'll save questions for the end. You can certainly put questions, comments, and chat as we go along, um, and then when we get to discussion, we can look at those or raise your hand or um, probably know the drill by now. So, um, okay. Our first presenter today will be Lisa Coleman, who is Professor Emerita at Southeastern Oklahoma State University, where she taught rhetoric, composition, and critical theory for 22 years, weaving Virginia Woolf throughout. She now teaches meditation at Mastermind Meditate and teaches yoga and meditation at the Matt Yoga Studio in Dallas, Texas. Since her retirement, she has been researching Virginia Woolf in the context of yoga and meditation, and this year through Buddhist existential philosophy. Her article, In Search of the True Self, Virginia Woolf, Yoga and Social Justice in Street Haunting and Beyond, will be published in the conference proceedings from the 29th Annual International Conference on Virginia Woolf, held at Mount St. Joseph University. Her paper today is titled, Rereading a Room of One's Own Through the Lens of Buddhism or Dharma's Ethical Injunction to Act. Nicola Apps currently identifies as a pansexual pagan. She is coming to you from Durumbo County, country, excuse me, central Queensland. She acknowledges sovereignty was never ceded and pays respect to the elders and ancestors of their land. Nicola is grateful to belong to a vibrant, rebellious community of writers, DRAW, which stands for Departing Radically in Academic Writing. Using poetry and performance, Nicola embraces Virginia's invitation to find new words and new methods to bring deep peace to the world, both inner and outer, by sharing her Mobius methodology and other tips for cultivating an androgynous mind aiming to stimulate an evolutionary leap in consciousness. Her paper today is titled, I Declare Peace on the World. Jody Med is Associate Professor of English and Women's and Gender Studies at Carleton University, located on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Nation in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. She is the author of Lesbian Scandal and the Culture of Modernism, and the editor of the Cambridge Companion to Lesbian Literature. Her recent work is forthcoming in Modernism slash Modernity, the edited collection Interrogating Lesbian Modernism, and the Rutledge Companion to Queer Theory and Modernism. Current interests include mindfulness and compassion in healing-centered education. Her paper today is titled Virginia Woolf's Contemplative Pedagogies. And I would ask presenters to please share your papers in chat if you have prepared, if you have prepared to do that. Um, and then also, unless you're presenting or later participating in discussion, please mute your mic as I am about to do. Um, and then Lisa, whenever you're ready, you may begin your presentation, please. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes, okay, great, great, great. Okay, sorry about that, thank you. Let me get this lined up. Okay. I don't see myself, but hopefully you do see me. All right. Yes, you're big, you're big on the screen. Oh, am I? Okay, very good. Do you, do you see my presentation, Diana? Uh, not any slideshow, if that's what you put up. I did. Yeah, I'm just seeing. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Let me. I must. I must not have to hit share. Hold on. I'm so sorry. Just one minute. No problem. Okay, I'm not quite sure why that's not working. 
Um, all right, well, I've hit share. I'm gonna try this again. Can you see the presentation? No, I'm just seeing you. Um, oh boy. Let's see. Um, Vic, I'm, I've never shared on Zoom, um, but okay. Victoria, <laughs> since um, is your PowerPoint or your presentation in the um, chat, Lisa, or did you just share your written text? Oh, no, I, I did not put my PowerPoint in the chat. Is that where it's supposed to be? No, but what I, my, what I, where I was going with that is if you're able to post it in chat, then maybe Victoria would be able to open it up and share it. And then oh, you could, I see. You could just tell her when to forward the slides. This happened in the last session I was in. Really? Okay, well, let's see. Um, uh, okay. Let's see if I can do that. Hold on, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that was not going to work. I tried this on Zoom myself and it seemed to work. So just hit the little uh, paper icon and then maybe yeah. double click on my presentation. Yes, and then you send it in the message. Right, I've double clicked it, but I don't see it doing anything. Okay, so you hit file with a little paper icon. You select it and then at the bottom of your little thing, it might say something like open or are you on a MacBook or a- I'm, uh, Yes, I bought a Mac. Okay, so hold on, let me share my screen with you and I'll show you. All right, can you see it? Um, to try to get mine out of the way. Um, yeah, okay, sort of, but yeah. I, I can't. Hold on. I can see it now, yes, I'm so sorry. It's okay, so you would like click on the message that you'd wanna send like this, and then you'd click open, and then it would share it with everybody and send it. So that's um, how you'd share it. All right, I'm trying to send it down in, 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 into the chat where you say to everyone with a little letter icon, is, is that what you're saying? Or somewhere yeah. else? Yeah, in the chat with the little okay, letter Okay, so I've done that. Um, here's my presentation. There you go, perfect. Oh, fi finally, okay, I'm so sorry. But yes, and so if you just bring up the first the first um, slide where it just says the title of my paper. All right. So it's taking a minute to open. Free reading of room one mill. Yeah, okay. That's it. Uh -huh. That's the first slide. Mm -hmm. Can you guys see it? Yes. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, if you awesome. can just have the first one showing only uh, over to the side. Beautiful. And I'll let you know when it's time to change it, because I guess you're going to be in charge of that. Already. Okay. All right. So thank you. Um, and I don't know how to you get my picture up there instead of yours, but it is. It is up. I got it. Thank you, Diane. Okay, I'm going to begin. So my 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 paper's fifteen. I'm only a. Uh, 15 minutes, so we should be good. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, my friends. I appreciate your patience. So, um, in his honors thesis, Beyond the Self, Identity, Impermanence, and the Meanings of Life in the Novels of Virginia Woolf, Neil A. Catalano finds the existential nature of Buddhist thought a useful lens 
for reading Wolf's fiction. In this paper, I extend that practice to her evocative book, A Room of One's Own, a brilliant, sometimes playful, yet perfectly serious essay that puts forward and supports her hard-won existential conviction that a woman must have money and a room of her own to write fiction. Catalano finds Stephen Batchelor's book, Buddhism Without Beliefs, a contemporary guide to awakening, particularly enlightening to his project for its succinct rendering of Siddhartha Gautama's awakening to what he calls, quote, the four ennobling truths, close quote. Those of anguish, its origins, its cessation, and the path leading to its cessation. That was also a quote. This awakening transforms Siddhartha into Buddha and sets him on a path of compassion that requires him to act, to share his life story and awakening with others. In parallel fashion, Virginia Woolf's life story, replete with her personal understanding of anguish, its origins, its cessation, and the path leading to its cessation, awakens her to her own dharma or purpose and to the aspects of her reality and experience that have compelled her to focus on the importance of material circumstances to a woman who would write fiction. As Bachelor makes clear, because different times change one's reality and life experience, imagination and lightness of touch are a requirement for those like the Buddha and Wolf who would tell stories and ask questions to inspire self-creation and cultural change. In A Room of One's Own, Wolf chooses not to tell her own story per se, <clears throat> given her family's history of educating only its sons, but to tell her story in such a way that her listeners and readers can imagine for themselves their own paths toward self-creation. I elaborate further on the Buddha below, largely using Bachelor's book as a guide, but first I turn to Catalano and his analysis of Wolf's fiction through Buddhist thought. Catalano's analysis lays the groundwork for my claim that Wolf's project in A Room of One's Own, published in 1929, is a real world call for the self and world creation she depicts in her fiction. And if you would change the slide now. All righty. Thank you. So this section, as you can see, is called Catalano's Reading of Wolf's Fiction Through a Buddhist Lens. And below that is my uh, ep uh, epigraph for this particular section. In the abstract for his paper, Catalano argues the novel of Mrs. Dalloway, published in 1925, to the Lighthouse in 1927, and The Waves, published in 1931, quote, posit a view of a self and world that is constantly in flux and points out that characters who embrace a more fluid, broader definition of selfhood are better equipped to deal with life's impermanence and the creation of a meaningful existence, close quote. He singles out Clarissa Dalloway in Mrs. Dalloway, Lily in To the Lighthouse, and Bernard in The Waves as having a sense that their selfhood is open and relies on interbeing with other people and things. In his analysis, characters who take this view suffer less than those who don't because of their sins that life's meaning also relies on this interbeing. For example, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey lead characters into the lighthouse. Both suffer due to their mistaken understanding of what selfhood constitutes. Mr. Ramsey suffers mightily from his self-centered desire to be remembered as a great scholar, while Mrs. Ramsey is drained by a self-directed mandate to fulfill the duties of wife and mother. Yet at night, when Mrs. Ramsey silently communes with the lighthouse and lets go of being and doing, she becomes, quote, oneself, a wedge-shaped core of darkness, close quote. And as this shape finds peace, in this moment, Mrs. Ramsey notices, quote, how one lent to things, trees, streams, flowers, felt they expressed one, in a sense, were one, close quote. 
While the Buddhist thought that underpins Catalano's analysis points to the transient nature of human existence and argues that anguish results from craving for life to be other than it is. He overtly states he's not saying Wolf was a Buddhist, even an accidental one. Instead, what's significant about life to the Buddha and what's significant to many of Wolf's characters is determined by the degree to which their sense of selfhood is in process and by by the degree to which their life's meaning results from feeling together with other living creatures and things. For Catalano, the sense of process and interbeing encourages the characters to have a more expansive understanding of the meaning of their lives that does not reside solely in themselves. For example, in Mrs. Dalloway, Clarissa Dalloway feels that even in death, she and her ex, Peter Walsh, will quote, survive somehow in the streets of London on the ebb and flow of things, let's quote. In the same fashion, at the end of To the Lighthouse, Lily, the artist, desires a connection with Mrs. Ramsey, even after her passing. In tribute to Mrs. Ramsey and in recognition of impermanence and what Catalano describes as, quote, the limits of a rigid self-concept, close quote, Lily finally finishes the painting of her mentor by drawing a line down its center. Catalano poetically describes Lily's achievement as, quote, the impermanence of life reconciled with the human need to find those markers of meaning that enable a life to be lived with purpose, close quote. Finally, in search for, for life's meaning in the waves, Bernard feels his self permeated by those of his friends. Quote, I do not altogether know who I am, Ginny, Susan, Neville, Rhoda, or Lewis, or how to distinguish my life from theirs, close quote. As Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh explains in No Death, No Fear, quote, our actions and our words take us in a linear direction, but they also take us in a lateral direction as they flow into and influence the world and the people around us, close quote. Um, and if you would go ahead and change to the next slide. Thank you. So this section is called Making a Case for the Four Truths and below that is the um, epigraph for this section. In Buddhism without beliefs, Stephen Batchelor elaborates on the four noble truths that constitutes Siddhartha Gautama's awakening to his Dharma practice. Dharma is not only the teachings of the Buddha, it is also, quote, those aspects of reality and experience with which his teachings are concerned. Siddhartha Gautama begins life as the son of an Indian king who has immured him in the family palace. Despite the king's efforts, his son grows up and insists on going out into the world, only to see one man disfigured by disease, another compromised by age, another who has died, and finally, a mendicant monk. These sights encourage Siddhartha to become a wandering monk himself and eventually to sit under a tree and meditate for seven days until awakened by the four truths. For the Buddha, proof of the Dharma takes place existentially. When you know in yourselves, is a quote, but importantly, right understanding and communication of that understanding are key. In Batchelor's reading, the Buddha is not a mystic, but a healer who diagnoses a problem and prescribes a remedy. Although reluctant to wade into, quote, the treacherous sea of words, close quote, out of compassion for others, he acts. He sets the Dharma wheel in motion when he gives his first talk to five other monks at the Deer Park at Sarnath, India, in which he names the four ennobling truths and teaches that, quote, anguish is to be understood, its origins to be let go of, its cessation to be realized and the path to be cultivated, close quote. As Bachelor crucially emphasizes, quote, 
Each truth requires being acted upon in its own particular way. Anguish is to be understood, its origins to be let go of, its cessation to be realized, and the path to be cultivated. Due, the, due to the difficulty of letting go of habits of thought, this is a process that must be repeated over and over as necessary. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So rereading a room of one's own truth, the path, anguish, and letting go. And then my epigraph follows from Richard Flority. Just as the Buddha tells his four truths in his first speech at the Deer Park in Sarnath, in the lectures on women in fiction that eventually become a room of one's own, Wolf offers her audience of young college women at Girton and Newnham what appear to be two truths about, quote, the need for money and a room, close quote, close quote. For evidence of women's poverty, she contrasts her visit to the men's university she calls Oxbridge with her visit to the women's college she calls Burnham. While Wolf insists she's not formulating truths, but offering an opinion about the room and the money, in chapter two, she will search for the truth of women's poverty in books from the British Museum written by men about women. We'll study Trevelyan's history of England in chapter three to help her imagine the sad truth of the short and bitter life Shakespeare's sister would have lived. And in later chapters, we'll peruse books by women writers for their truth about women. For Wolf further argue, allows that the story she does tell in A Room of One's Own will be augmented by fiction and even by an obfuscation of the eye of the narrator. Like the Buddha, she meditates on her talk and makes her topic experiential, quote. I pondered it, she says, and made it work in and out of my daily life, quote, quote. Though she claims truth will be elusive and insists the audience must work to find it, as with the Buddha, themes of truth, walking paths, and cultivating the path play a role. To cultivate the path requires returning to it over and over, to rise to the challenge of realizing and understanding truth when it's found. Wolf ushers in suffering or anguish the first noble truth of Buddhism when her narrator pushes open the garden gate at Fernham, only to find the October day transformed in the heart-wrenching beauty of a spring twilight. From this moment through the next four chapters, the differences between men and women, the self-centered ego-driven nature of men and the family and home-oriented but sometimes self-driven nature of women writ large by Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey in Claude Tolano's analysis and by the real life Leslie and Julia Stephen are apparent. It's not until the last chapter that the narrator lets go of the anguish of craving for life to be other than it is. In the opening scene, a leaf falls in London and a man and a woman enter the same taxi after approaching from the opposite side of the street. The tension of looking for differences finally relieved, the narrator first turns to Coleridge and the marriage of opposites in androgyny, and then offers up the poorest mind of Shakespeare with its open man-womanly orientation, an orientation that could correspond with a woman-manly orientation perspective in the minds of women. With this turn, we may recall the open self Neil Cartolano finds in Clarissa Dalloway, Lily, and Bernard. Could we have the final slide, please? Thank you. To close yet remain open. And then there's my epigraph. I argued at the beginning of this paper that a rim of one's own is a book of self-creation that inspires self-creation. In it, Virginia Woolf eschews telling her own story so as not to be accused of having an ax to grind. But Woolf, like the Buddha, enables her listeners and readers to see their own path toward self-creation. The path of hard work and the habit of mental freedom that will give rise 
to, to another Judith Shakespeare, or at least to the possibility of someone like me. Reading A Rim of One's Own for the first time in 1987 made me sure I could write a dissertation, made me sure I could have a career and support my daughter, made me sure I could create myself and give back the way Wolf gave back and continues to give back to all those afraid to step into the unknown, create their own lives and make their own way. Rereading this book in 2022 through the lens of Buddhism, almost 100 years after it was published, I'm certain that legacy will continue. I'm done. Thank you, Lisa, for that <laughs> insightful investigation of Wolf's work. Thank you. Okay. Um, Nicola, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Diana, and thank you, Lisa. I could not have asked for a, a better um, foundation to work from. I just want to get some atmospherics happening here. See if this works. Um, I'll start with a, a poem, Invoking Virginia. The night before a salon involving and revolving around Virginia Woolf and Simone de Beauvoir, I fell asleep somewhere between subject and object, curled within a comforting radical centricity. I woke to the sensation of wet hands pulling on my naked leg. Twas Virginia, I knew it straight away, not pulling me into the river ooze, but pulling herself out, body of water from body of water. I woke for real then, terror in my heart. The vision so impactful to my mind's eye, she stood there, a drip, drip, dripping on my bedroom floor, everything long and limp, riverweed caught in the folds of her stone pocket jacket, hair clung head hanging down, curved she was, like a treble clef or a question mark perhaps, a drip, drip, dripping on my bedroom floor. What did she have to say for herself, I was asked. I didn't know the answer, not confidently, but death is an illusion fell from my lips and it was too late to swallow them down again. The words were free with all their echoes, memories and associations, imprinting on the air the etheric real, making it clear the air is thick with our dead. A hot bath, a warm towel, a cosy bed, loving arms. Now the deep vein thrombosis of my now from the deep vein thrombosis of my psychosis, Virginia and I think peace into existence together. This is how we do it. Turn off the special effect. We take full responsibility, embrace bell hooks wise and loving politics of visionary feminism and make a commitment to ending patriarchal domination, knowing that a genuine feminist politics always brings us from bondage to freedom, from lovelessness to loving. Embrace also the wisdom that we but mirror the world, that's Gandhi. How can we have peace in our world if we are at war with ourselves? being kind and calm whilst killing our inner Trump and dragging up into consciousness the subconscious Hitlerism that holds us down is a good start. It's not easy. Immersing myself in thoughts of war and violence in preparation for this paper to the background noise of military exercises taking place just north of me, Air Force jets, bombs, machine gun fire, a loud and insistent reminder of the dull dread of war, plummeted me deep into the heart of darkness and the sense of horror held me powerless. I was caught in a spiraling loop of despair until I experienced what Sarah Ahmed calls a feminist snap. Sarah says, by snapping you are saying, I will not reproduce a world I cannot bear, a world I do not think should be born. 
echoing Virginia at the end of her pacifist essay, Three Guineas, we can best help you to prevent war, not by repeating your words and following your methods, but by finding new words and creating new methods. Perhaps it's time to seed an evolutionary leap and birth a new consciousness. Finding ways out of limiting polar logic may help. Over the long course of my teaching career, I developed what I call the Mobius methodology, a rich task method of giving materiality to philosophical thought, deconstruction 101, basically. I'll see if I can share my screen. Is that working? Yes. Come on. The class begins by drawing yin-yang symbols and brainstorming binary opposites. We engage in substantive whole class discussion about how different words associate with each other. Students then choose some pairs of opposites and write one of each pair on either side of a strip of paper. We create a loop agreeing that we have created a two-sided, two-edged object with an inside and an outside. Then I ask the children to put one simple twist in their loop and glue it in place. We are engaging in a simple twist of perception. By drawing a line along their strip, children discover they have created a one-sided, one-edged object. That stopped sharing yet? <laughs> okay. Um, this simple exercise challenges binary thinking and has generated deep discussions around race, gender fluidity and justice, uh, stimulating some genuine aha moments with comments from children like racism is stupid and there's nothing wrong with being gay, is there? Living in the middle of a Mobius strip is living in the sweet spot of life. It is emancipatory, eschewing either or for and and. The Mobius methodology offers a wonderful starting point for developing an androgynous mind. In 1892, Coleridge wrote, the truth is a great mind must be androgynous. Arguably, that is the one contribution he made to feminist thought. And only because Virginia Woolf took that seed and placed it in a womb of her own, nurturing it to fruition. We have tipped too far into patriarchy and have lost our balance. Now we are turning, becoming more matrifocal in each unfolding moment. From the middle of the Mobius strip, solutions can be found within the problems. Balance can be restored. Occupying this philosophical space of oneness has helped me hold opinions more lightly, loosen my grip on any particular identity, become a better listener and a more peaceful communicator. Inner peace flows into our homes, our communities, our institutions. A quickening is taking place. The Academy is being urged to open their doors, minds and hearts to other epistemologies and ontologies, to actively welcome more Indigenous, Earth-honouring and peace-oriented perspectives, including so-called Eastern philosophies. The modernist period heralded the beginning of this shift. Despite Virginia's certain and emphatic assertion that there is no God, Eastern religion was saturating Wolf's academic and artistic circles, and some scholars believe she was deeply influenced by Eastern philosophy. Members of the Bloomsbury group and their friends jumped in and out of each other's heads with gay abandon, and it is easy to imagine Virginia engaging in robust discussion with T.S. Eliot, Dickinson and McTaggart, 
the Cambridge reincarnationists, and Bertrand Russell about the entanglement of Buddhist philosophy and contemporary scientific theories such as Einstein's theory of relativity. Perhaps contemplation of these ideas accounts in part for the mystical quality of Virginia's writing, her ability to dip into characters' consciousness. Though atheist, she calls our attention to a hidden pattern connecting us all. The whole world is a work of art and we are parts of the work of art. We are the word, we are the music, we are the thing itself. Some collaboration has to take place in the mind between the woman and the man before the art of creation can be accomplished, Virginia says. Her continued insistence that our minds are both masculine and feminine resonates beautifully with the psychic physiology of yoga that Hindis have taught for thousands of years. The lamp in the spine does not light on beef and prunes, but it does light on breath and focused concentration. Another poem, Awakening Kundalini. This is just another ancient story, yet I make it real by putting it into words. Within the human body, some say, there is a psychic physiology corresponding to the physical yet subtler than thought. Three major nadis, psychic energy channels, begin at Mulada, the root chakra. So Shumna goes straight up the spine through all the chakras to Sahasra, the crown, merging with universal consciousness. Ida, the feminine, Shakti, emerges from the left. Pingala, the masculine, Shiva, emerges from the right, much like the caduceus, traditional symbol of Hermes, messenger of the gods. They weave around Sushumna. All the asanas, pranayamas, mudras and bandhas of yoga are directed toward the goal of bringing the masculine and feminine parts of oneself into perfect balance. Both nostrils flowing freely, feeding both hemispheres of the brain with prana equally. One becomes enlightened when Shiva and Shakti unite in divine ecstasy in the pineal gland, the third eye, origin of the evolutionary impulse. By doing the practices, I have had real glimpses, experienced timeless moments of being in a perfectly peaceful oneness with all that is. In this place, race and gender do not exist. Countries do not exist. In this place, there is no separation between humanity and the rest of life. No separation between you and I. This place is love. And I'll give the last word of this paper and then I've got a little um, recorded thing at the end. But um, the last word I'm giving to Starhawk, um, the witch, who again echoes Virginia we are all interconnected. Perhaps that simple pagan truth could lead us to create a world in which the fabric of life is cherished in the individual and the whole and violence is transformed by love. Sure, that's working. Technology don't love it. Come on. Um, words, not just English words, but all the words from every language across the world. Full of echoes, memories, association. Every word ever spoken, though only breath, is immortal, resonating in space and time, settling into the very marrow of our bones, into the earth herself. English words. Let's have a particularly violent and acquisitive history. 
conquering and colonizing from an unquestioning position of superiority. Yet they themselves have been colonized, pinned down to one useful meaning. They may hate being useful. They hate making money. They hate being lectured about in public. Words insist upon their freedom to change, for it is their nature to change. The truth they try to catch is many-sided. So words themselves must be many-sided, flashing first this way, then that, like light falling upon the leaves of trees. Power flows through words, through sentences, through entire discourses, and so words mean different things to different people. They are utterly subjective. For change to occur, writers must write, readers must read dangerously. Must, 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 detestable word. Words certainly have the capacity to create beauty, to tell the truth. to change the balance of power. To think peace into existence. They are the wildest priest, most irresponsible, most unteachable of all things. They live in the mind. Perhaps then, if humanity is to tip the scale toward truth and beauty and peace, then the mind itself has to change, and indeed perceptions of the mind need to change. Some marriage of opposites must be consummated. The whole of the mind must lie wide open. And so, from the delicious society of my own body, I create an androgynous mind, a mind that is resonant and porous, that transmits emotion without impediment, that is natural, creative, incandescent and undivided. What joy to discover once these nuptials have taken place in the mind and union at last occurs. That golden silence embraces and infuses one's consciousness, rendering identity as a separate self wholly redundant. The desire for words simply disappears from this space, this deeply connected place, we can declare peace on the world silently. Thank you. <laughs> wow, Nicola, thank you for that engaging and uplifting presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, okay, catch your breath. <laughs> say, um, Jody, whenever you're ready. Okay, I'll just see if I can share screen. Yeah, that's got it, I think. Okay, I don't know how to follow after that. <laughs> All right. Um, the words I wrote are very appropriate here. I'm aware that the audience at a Wolf Conference is a very special audience, one like no other. And because I'm addressing such a special audience, I'm offering some thoughts I don't think I could offer anywhere else but within the privacy of our own society. And it's not just that I can assume levels of familiarity, indeed expertise with Wolf's writing. 
is that I can also assume a loving dedication and attachment to Wolf's writing, which has just been so clearly demonstrated. I also hope I can um, assume some forgiveness for taking some risks. This is not really a, a conventional paper either. A while back, I had my first chance to teach a Wolf graduate seminar. I felt like a bit of an imposter, admitting to the class that while I had been reading and studying Wolf for years, and I'd even been published on Wolf, I certainly did not consider myself a Wolf scholar. I had not dedicated my whole career to Wolf. I had not read everything by Wolf. I inevitably stumble, stumble over biographical details. No, I knew there were people, people who attended the Virginia Wolf Conference, who knew Wolf's oeuvre and scholarship inside out. Indeed, I told the class on my first time attending a Wolf Conference, which was also my first conference as a grad student, so quite a long time ago, and how I overheard some silver haired women scoff at a claim in a paper muttering to one another, Virginia would never think that. Now this really took me aback as a grad student. I wouldn't be that kind of Wolf scholar. Indeed, I'd never be that presumptuous to claim such an intimacy with Wolf or any author in that way. At the time of my class, I identified myself more as a fan. Now I call myself a student of Wolf, maybe even a practitioner in reading Wolf. Indeed, today, I want to consider how reading Wolf is itself a practice in the way we use that term, practicing karate, practicing yoga, practicing piano, a writing practice, a meditation practice. So here I want to propose thinking of reading Wolf as a practice, as in fact, a contemplative practice. Like any practice, it is one that's ongoing, never complete, even if you have read everything by Wolf. It's never complete because every time you read Wolf, return to her work, it's always fresh, as if issued to children on a beach from Mrs. Dalloway. Um, it's a sudden revelation, an illumination, a match burning in a crocus, an inner meaning almost expressed. It not only tells us about moments of being, it awakens those moments in us and for us. Indeed, what is more epithanic than reading and rereading Wolf? And again, if you're at the plenary, um, Gretchen Holbrook Grisina said this same thing, her rereading, epithanic rereadings of it. Um, I think that's something we share. It is a practice both reassuring and exhilarating. It teaches us, it invites us, invites us to pay attention to what is commonly thought small rather than what is commonly thought big, to the mark on the wall, to the atoms as they fall upon the mind, to a myriad impressions. Can you still see that? Okay, sorry, a myriad impressions, um, trivial, fantastic evanescence or engraved with the sharpness of steel. To the granite and the rainbow, it teaches us, invites us, awakens us, not just to be better readers, but to be more awake to our own livingness, whether we call it life or spirit, or truth or reality, this the essential thing. Simply reading Wolf, we forget that we are holding a book. We seem to be living, not reading. I expect many of us feel our full livingness when we read Wolf. That is why we're here together now. In this way, lately, I've been inspired to think of Wolf's writing as a form and model and practice of contemplative pedagogy. Wolf's writing demonstrates sustained, focused, attentive engagement with the here and now of the intimately entangled inner and outer worlds of the human and more than human. As she writes in her diary in November 1935, I and the not I and the outer and the inner. Her writing meditates upon the full presence of the moment, its felt sense, but also its delicate interface with both the past and the yet to come in a way that is simultaneously embodied and transcendent, solitary and communal. Again, for anyone ever teaches Wolf, you know we always, it's always both and when it comes to Wolf. Um, and I was just at a panel before that was reflecting on moments of being um, very intensely and beautifully, so calling upon that. And we read Wolf not only because her writing demonstrates such revealing, insightful attention, but because it teaches us, it teaches us how to attend as well. It is simultaneously a demonstration, an invitation, and a manifestation of attentive devotion, fully attending to, tending to, life in the present moment, again and again, with loving awareness. 
And with more time here, we might consider some you know, con contemporary definitions of mindfulness that are also drawing from ancient wisdom traditions, as well as sort of their current Western applications. But I think all of that can be summed up in Wolf's question um, from her essay, The Moment. Yet what composed the present moment? It is precisely in how Wolf's writing simultaneously enacts and models for us, but also invites us through our practice of reading to participate in the steadying attention to the moment and to reap insights from such contemplation that I see Wolf's work as a form of contemplative pedagogy. The term contemplative pedagogy is one I'm adapting from philosophies and practices of pedagogy that involve contemplative practices, often drawing upon contemporary secular Buddhism or other world wisdom and contemplative traditions. It's a term contemplative pedagogy that's been gaining more attention and traction in higher, in higher education and also um, in JK, you know, kindergarten and up, but I'm uh, thinking of higher education. It has a rich bibliography and this is intentionally compact. So you can't read it all just to indicate um, these are just um, uh, scholarly work on contemplative pedagogy in higher education in particular. However, it is not just a theory or set of classroom activities. It begins with the teacher's own inner practice and being, how they are, what they model, how they attend to what is, and how they relate with those with whom they are learning. I also appreciate that conjoining contemplative pedagogy with Wolf activates rich, complex, and lively histories of Wolf scholarship. There are extensive bibliographies on Wolf and pedagogy. Um, ben Hagen's work particularly resonates for me with this. And on Wolf and whatever concepts might be invoked with the term contemplative, be it spiritual, philosophical, metaphysical, the sacred, epiphanic and even how these terms, pedagogy and the contemplative interact in relation to Wolf. I realize and recognize the richness of the scholarship and all there is to learn from it. For me in attempting in adapting the term contemplative pedagogy in relation to Wolf, I intend it to help me invoke how many things are happening at once when we read Wolf. We can say that her writing presents ideas to us, ideas about the moment, this moment in, of June, about spirit, reality, about I and the not I, inner and outer, or what Buddhist and master scholar and poet Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing, already referenced in Lisa's paper. But of course, we have many other terms from many other knowledge systems and traditions for this, interaction calling upon um, feminist materialism, quantum entanglement, interdependence, inaction, interconnection, intersubjectivity, call it by any name you please. As much as Will's writing is showing and telling us about such ideas, it is also modeling what she's talking about, not least by continually experimenting and innovating upon form with this kind of continual open curiosity with regard to form. And further, our experience of reading and rereading, returning to this writing in our reading practice, enacts its own instructive transformation for us, in us, through us. Reading Wolf is never just reading. It is an embodied process of experiential learning. To use her words again, we seem to be living, not reading. Or we might say living and by and through reading. Many examples flood in here. Certainly a sketch of the past might surface first. It's already come up um, it, to the, in, in this panel and previous ones, of course, I major, I'm not the only one who chants inwardly to myself, we are the words, we are the music, we are the thing itself. Um, Wolf's transformative insight with the flower um, in Sketch of the Past, which I won't go through, um, I'll trust that it's familiar, um, and her reflection on her shock receiving capacities shimmers with the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh on interbeing, in which he invokes a flower. He invokes considering how a flower is made of what he calls non-flower elements. So he basically says, and he uses this in many of his teachings, look into a flower and we see it is made of all these other elements without which there would be no flower. So he says in the end, so our observation tells us that the flower is full of the whole cosmos, while at the same time, it is empty of a separate self-existence, which to me echoes very much um, with Wolf. And I'm not the first to sort of um, see, put this together, but I do think Wolf and Han walk together in many ways. Um, that's for another paper. Um, to the lighthouse, 
um, also for me exemplifies Wolf's contemplative pedagogy. Each time I attend to it, it both awakens and breaks my heart. How Mrs. Ramsey is at times the most attentive, the most insightful, spiritual and metaphysical philosopher in literature. Her greatest insights revealed only to us to teach us something though intimated by Lily Briscoe. And if we had the time, I would invite us to linger over the knitting scene in chapter 11 of the window with its extended meditative process. And again, I think it was brought up in Lisa's paper um, and rich insights as Mrs. Ramsey settles so deeply into the moment while she's knitting as to both fully inhabit and dissolve the self, accessing um, freedom, a sense of mobility, peace, um, and most welcome of all, a summoning together, a resting on a platform of stability. And this communing of the I with the not I um, develops, right? Um, as she's sitting there knitting, um, losing personality and connecting with the lighthouse. Um, she finds herself sitting and looking, sitting and looking until she became the thing she looked at, that light, for example. Again, this is a, uh, passage practitioners of Wolf will know well. Um, and as she's sitting there, she's, she meets the stroke of the lighthouse, which is like meeting her own eyes and how in a way she becomes these inanimate things. When she's alone, she can meet with it. Um, feel they become one, felt they knew one, in a sense were one, felt an irrational tenderness thus. She looked at the long study light as for, her, for herself. And then that sort of, sitting and watching until becoming, um, I think can, is nicely summed up in this um, uh, poem by um, eighth century poet Li Bei, also known as Li Po, who was translated by um, Pound, um, which I won't read here. I'll just let you take it in quickly. Um, but this is basically what is happening with um, Mrs. Ramsey as she knits and she becomes the lighthouse until only the lighthouse remains. But from there, it leads to another process for her because as she always does, Wolf doesn't just tell us about Mrs. Ramsey's experience and she doesn't just show us, she enacts it. She conjures it for and in us, that shimmering experience between I and not I and what comes from it. We seem to be living, not reading or living through reading. And Wolf achieves this as she often does with a pronoun. Consider how the pronoun reference travels in this passage. So this is still reflecting on the, the light of the lighthouse, right? So she's looking at the steady light, um, recalling how it's at, her beck, at its beck and call, recalling it, um, waking in the night, seeing it bent across their bed, watching it. As if it's, and then it enters into her. There'd be many readings of this, so I just want to, I'm doing it quickly, um, as if it's stroking her fingers it, with its fingers, um, a sealed vessel in her brain. So it's within now. But this it, which was the light, then we move to another verb or another noun, excuse me, happiness, right? She had known happiness, exquisite happiness, and it silvered the rough waves a little more brightly. So our it here is now the light, but also potentially the happiness as daylight faded and the blue went out of the sea and it rolled in waves of pure lemon, which curved and swelled. So our it, I think at this point, my colors are supposed to indicate it, you know, we, it's the it of the light and the happiness and the blue of the sea, which roll in waves of pure lemon. And then they not only break on the beach, right? But um, waves of pure delight race through the floor of her mind. And she felt, it is enough. So by we get time we get to this last it is it has collected up all of these this full experience of interbeing and it, again I would argue um, engages that in us as a reader right what this it can hold. There are many more examples. There are endless passages in Wolf's writing that constitute moments of contemplation or presence, opening into insight and. What, and what can follow from it, a kind of liberation, not just for a character or wolf, but for the reader. Again, to use something from To the Lighthouse, one wants so many more than 50 pairs of eyes to read with. 50 pairs of eyes are not enough to get around that one author. So this is just to say that right now I'm finding it helpful to think of wolf alongside thinking about contemplative pedagogies. 
this conjoining helps me understand why for me reading reading and rereading wolf and even listening to wolf right audio wolf um, constitutes a sacred practice even in ethics of reading i suspect i'm not the only one who experiences reading wolf as a contemplative nearly meditative practice we continually return to her writing again and again like returning to the breath and meditation with openness and curiosity we enjoy perennially fresh discoveries while reading Wolf. And I feel that in the conference, right? I feel people returning to it again and again with these, and I'm what we benefit from hearing it. And I see Wolf's work as practicing and teaching forms of ethically engaged contemplative life. And I see this work aligned with a time now, a present deepening turn in our own time towards connecting contemplative life with progressive social and environmental transformation. In other words, whereby contemplative practices engage ethical social action and being. In this way, I propose that the practice of reading Wolf, when we're open to learning from its invitations, is a richly ethical act with rippling effects and implications. Indeed, if I may presume such intimacy as to adapt Wolf's words from a sketch of the past, here, now, in our era of suffering and multiple pandemics, illness, violence, inequity, injustice, eco-crisis. I wager I'm not alone in how I feel when I spend my time reading Wolf, when I might be walking, running a shop, or learning to do something that will be useful if war comes. I feel at times that by reading Wolf, I am doing what is far more necessary than anything else. I have to stop sharing now. Hold it. That was fantastic. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> thank you, Jody, for that thought-provoking approach to Wolf. Um, three wonderful presentations that work so well together. Um, I have to admit, I I don't I know nothing about um, you know Buddhism and yoga and <laughs> any of the things that you referenced like that. But when each of you spoke, I understood and followed along. But I uh, I'm not going to kick off with a a question. <laughs> I will open that up to other people. I'm just looking at all the positive uh, comments in the chat. Isn't it lovely? I love that about this group. <laughs> and not just this one, but the whole conference group. Everyone's so lovely. <laughs> Well, I'm just thrilled that um, we were on a similar page there. It's, um, I, I really felt like an outsider. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing some more work published in this arena because I think it's a really rich scene that hasn't been explored very, um, very much yet. I don't know if I can articulate this well because I am... I'm a traditional scholar and I'm trying to I'm trying to move, I'm trying to bring contemplative life and practice more central into scholarship and teaching. And it's a very weird line to cross, right? I imagine. Oh I mean, God. Lisa, it's in interesting. It's um and um, but it is just different frames of reference. So I think it is very interesting, right? That we can call upon our Sedgwicks and our Kristevas to give us frames of reference for understanding what Wolf is doing. But when we call, when we aim to call upon other traditions, then the question I find it is historicized. Well, did Wolf read Buddhism? You know, like, and it's like, well, it's not claiming, it's not claiming that, right? It's claiming just in the way I've seen beautiful papers reading um, Ta-Nehisi Coates with Wolf, right? Well, how can we read some of these other figures with Wolf and what is it there? And it's, it's a big thing for me because again, of what I'm trained in, I'm not trained to value this as a form of, of academic discourse, right? Nor am I, nor am I a scholar, right? Nor am I a scholar of um, Buddhism or these Buddhism traditions at this point, but I do recognize those scholars and what they have to offer. And I think it can be a lens through which we can see what Wolf is doing. Because again, I've just been to papers that are so beautiful, but the, and they are very much talking about wolf training, presence, full presence, and then what happens, right? And when we see that, when we see Mrs. Um, Ramsey or Mrs. Dalloway or whomever, 
having that moment of presence and what it opens into, right? It just reads so beautifully in relation to, even as, as you were using these um, secular Buddhism, right? Like it's not in Buddhism, not as a religion, but as a, a philosophy, a psychology and everything. But it's, it's very, ugh, you know, <laughs> because I also live in the other world of the other language and, and everything else, or I try to live, but you can't bridge them too much. Anyway, I'll stop. I see Lisa's hands up, so. Yeah, let me, let me take that down. Thank you, Jody. The, the, um, both uh, your paper and Nicole's uh, paper slash presentation uh, and enactment of so many things that I've been thinking about Wolf. And But I, I so appreciate both of you knowing that you're in the world. Uh, it makes me feel like, um, you know, I was on a track that other people have been pursuing, you know, longer and more deeply than I, I've been able to. Um, I also suffer from that, um, you know, I've been a, a, a huge fan of Wolf since I wrote my dissertation and, and borrowed Wolf for composition theory. Um, and that was a long time ago in the early 90s. Um, but it, it, it really wasn't until I uh, began teaching yoga and then I honestly retired that I felt like I was able to open the door to this other way of thinking about Wolf. And I, I honestly didn't know she wrote an essay called The Moment, which is terrible that I don't know it uh, as a meditation teacher, but I will certainly be looking it up. And uh, both you wonderful uh, ladies today have just uh, further opened this door that I was really pretty terrified to even uh, open, much less go through, um, because it seemed far-fetched or something. And, and yet it's, it absolutely is not far-fetched. I mean, you, you both just provided uh, boatloads of evidence that any uh, scholar will, will be delighted to know about. And I'm, you know, so I'm talking about myself, so delighted to follow uh, in your footsteps uh, through, through this door that I was really afraid to open in, in, until the last five years. Um, I, I'm not sure why I had that feeling, but I just didn't feel like it was ground I could tread. And um, uh, Neil Cacciolano, who, you know, I directed an honors program for most of the time of the 22 years I, I taught at my university. Well, he, this was his honors thesis. And it was the only thing I could find on Wolf and Buddhism that was published. I, I mean, it was online. And, and I, he wrote that in 19, uh, sorry, uh, 2017. So not very long ago. And um, I, I, anyway, I, I don't want to just hog the, the airtime here, but I just want both of you to know how much I appreciate what you offered and what you had to say and what you uh, even performed today in your, in your presentations. It was just wonderful for me. So thank you. Straight back at you. It's so nice to know you're in the world. <laughs> yes, thank you. Paula. Uh, these were wonderful papers, and it's nice to know that there's still new ground to uncover regarding Wolf, but not esoteric stuff that's like, who cares about this little doodad or animal or bird or something that appears in her writing, but something that really relates to my life or anyone's life who cares to look into this. That's, that's what I really love about what the three of you who pres have presented here today. And I don't mean to be snarky about people who are writing about other things that don't connect to my life, because there's, there's a point to that and there's a space for that. But this is what I really appreciate um, because we all love Wolf for various reasons. And I think we all know on some level that she has something to tell us about our lives and how we live them and how we think and love and just do things. Um, but what you've presented, uh, the three of you presented here today is some very interesting groundwork. And you've really developed that idea in some concrete ways. And, and I appreciate mm -hmm. that very much. It, it was very meaningful to me. So thank you. So there's no question there. Oh, coming from you, Paula, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. 
And, and maybe I, that touches, touches on um, what Lisa was saying about how you didn't feel until you were retired that you could, you know, like really explore and, and, and re- get into this because mm-hmm. it's not the um, kind of standard expected, you know, scholarship we're teaching to do mm-hmm. even, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I'm so excited, though, about the shift that is happening in higher education. I can feel it. It's, you know, in Australia, you know, there are radio programs about where university, the neoliberal model that we're we're straining to operate under um, is failing humanity and and offering different solutions ecoversities and free universities and I can just sense and and I think it's a natural progression um, once more indigenous voices are welcomed you know for example and as I as um, you said Diane at the intro um, in the room today we have Liz McKinley who and Mel's a member too, started this wonderful group, Draw, Departing Radically in Academic Writing. So it's a very conscious uh, challenge to, to those old structures that have kept so many voices silent for so long, too long. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very interesting how the concatenation of all these um, pandemics have functioned in that it's forcing universities to, to reconsider themselves, right? While we're still under this crazy financial pressure or whatever, but we had, again, in Canada, right? There's a movement towards the indigenization of the university. Well, isn't that, in a, again, in an institution that is founded in, in colonization, right? And so it means the whole institution, and I know if you're further ahead in Australia than we are in Canada, but the whole institution has to, you know, change, right? And, and same with, um, BLM and everything else. So it's, and what for me is that language that I remember the language of compassionate grading. I don't know if that's circulated, but ours was compassionate grading, compassionate deadlines. And I was like, but do we know what compassion is? Right? Like there's a, there's a, there's a wisdom history to like, there's a whole philosophy of what compassion is, but it's again, something that gets kind of appropriated. So I do think it's a window of opening where we're, where they're attending to what we could call the inner life of of students, but it's like, but we need some more ways to address that than what we have available. Like, it's not just the student health psychology, right? Like that's, you know, I, I'm not, I feel like it's a big issue here, but um, but yeah, I feel like there, there is a, a possibility for other kinds of conversations um, are necessary, but, but they're awkward because people don't know how to have them. Yeah. Because we're two in the head. Right. right. Yeah, and that, that's why I'm so excited by new materialism and embodied perspectives, you know, mm. it, it just encourages us to spread our consciousness through our body. And if anyone's ever done a Vipassana retreat, anyone, have you done that? Um, 10 days of silence, so sitting in meditation in silence for 10 days, which is really challenging. But it, it's so beautiful. You, you actually, by the end of that time, you're sweeping consciousness through your whole body, you know. And, and well, the only other thing I can um, um, align it to is LSD tripping or, you know. It's, so, so very, very different, different way of experiencing life. And if I can just, if I can say one more, just um, tacking back to, I think what I was coming up with what Paula said, I do think it's really interesting because we talk so much about what Wolf, what Wolf is figuring out, like, or what Wolf, what Wolf's ideas are, and we parse them so precisely. And then there seems to be the loss of like, but then what is that doing to us? Like, she's not just writing this, I mean, she's writing it to figure it out, but it is that communication, right? And so kind of being aware of, we keep going back to her. I mean, and the amount that people were reading Wolf in the pandemic, right? And just that feeling of actually, if I can do nothing else and I can read Virginia Wolf right now, then that's that's enough. Um, but I, I just find sometimes the discussion, but I'm, I attended some panels where at least the discussion that like maybe Wolf's making a leap for the, that the reader can get a- access to this too, 
But I do think that's why we keep going back. That's where I think of it as this practice we go back to again and again. Yeah. I well, think it's I think it's so refreshing that we can include the personal in our discussion of Wolf. I taught women's studies, and of course, we always talked, or not always, but personal perspectives, personal experiences were always a big part of the discussion in the classroom. And um, that's some often missing, you know, when we present papers about Wolf. Yet we all have a personal engagement with her and a personal response to her. And it's so refreshing to hear that from all of you today. Yeah, good old autoethnography. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really, I really appreciate um, what everybody has said ab about uh, the, this topic, um, the idea of the personal falling out of the head into the body. Um, these are such important things and such important things. Um, I no longer teach uh, writing, but I do teach yoga. I do teach meditation. And, and yet I am a person that lives very much in my head. I have to really work to come out of it. Uh, that's just part of the way I was trained and probably a natural proclivity anyway. But um, uh, that idea, I don't even know, let's see what you said, um, Nicola, the new, what'd you say, new materiality, the body perspective. Um, I'm not sure I've, her, oh, I mean, well, I, 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 I know about meditation retreats, but I have not done one. Not, I mean, I've done a day one but, or maybe even a three day one, but not, um, not 10 days and nothing like that. Um, but now it, it changes you to do Definitely. that. Yeah. It has a transformative uh, quality. Because just, oh, and then it, that ties in with what Jody was saying about the, uh, read, uh, the idea of reading Wolf as a practice. It's such a beautiful way to put what I feel about reading her. And, and when I began studying meditation, I was just, suddenly was like reading her again with brand new eyes and, and seeing the, the contemplative qualities there, the meditative qualities of her, of her writing and how beautiful it just tied in with what I was learning in, in, about meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just that's, thrilled. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I'm just was reiterating. I was just thrilled that whoever um, chose and organized, collated or curated these um, these presentations is something else because, like, I can't think of two better <laughs> people to present with. <laughs> yeah. I, I cannot disagree with you. I mean... It, it's like, and I, I almost never do this. I did a, a, a group of three, me and Elisa Sparks and uh, another of our colleagues, but it's not something I ever do because I always seem to be out in left field somewhere with what I do. And I can't ever even imagine somebody who could also be doing this with me. But today it is as though we propose this to happen. And we yes. work together to make that happen, but yeah. we did not. We are all <laughs> interconnected. <laughs> yes, we we so we that we are. It's just we incredible. are. It's true. It's, See, that's the other the thing about it. Yeah. It's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's the evidence. Yeah, You're crazy. right. Yeah. 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 And wonderful. And what, what I'm finding. Sorry. Oh gosh. I no, was I'm just going to add that. <laughs> um. I mean, the piece that's going on now too about all what needs to be addressed, that's where I'm finding now um, how mindfulness practices are necessary because it's embodied and it's reflective and it's that deep transformative work that's necessary in terms of racial justice facing white yeah. supremacy. Yeah. Because you, yeah. can do, you can do all the surface reading you want, right? And you can do the training, but it's that, it's that. And so that's where I found the most profound work is done and so that I'm finding those linked together that's where I'm thinking of it as a kind of an eth an ethical choice an ethical practice right mm. just like this who I mean Thich Nhat Hanh what he did in terms of um being what he called engaged Buddhism and I think mm. of that into in a way with Wolf as well and you know my writing is my fighting or my thinking is my fighting is her language but I think of her as an engaged contemplative right there's and even things that 
um, oh, um, the plenary yesterday um, about uh, times on thinking of peace in times of war. Oh, air raid um oh yeah, but, no, yeah, yeah oh, I'm, getting, I'm losing my language i'm too tired right now but anyway yeah, i that feel so i think brilliant. of wolf as a as a contemplative an engaged contemplative if that makes mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. yeah yeah a sacred activist hmm. but I mean, let's just say it, it's clear that not many people are interested in this topic. It's a, <laughs> a small audience, which that's actually was true. reassuring to me. <laughs> um. But that's okay. That's okay. It's, <laughs> um, that was, part of its yeah. time of day and, and uh, draw some big names in other panels going at the same that's time. That's what I was hoping. Actually. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, yeah, I was really thrilled to be here, and I know the other participants were by all the comments that I'm <laughs> so it's fantastic. Thanks for your tech help, Victoria. Yes. Oh, and, yes. and you're Thank calm. You. You're just, so we're so much. calm. <laughs> yes, I'm Very so calm. grateful. Truly Very appreciated grateful. that. Um, and, and thank you all for your for your wonderful presentations and um it was nice to meet the new people um and um paula and lisa it was great to see you again and hopefully we'll be in person next year yes i <laughs> hope so too and thank you for uh being our ho host uh, host uh, mm -hmm. today and uh doing such a great job with um uh, being patient with me trying to get my stuff in there. So I was worried for weeks about doing it. And it turned out that, uh, Victoria, you did it for me. So thank you. <laughs> I, I, was very, I was very appreciative of that. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for letting me sit in on your panel. I learned a lot. Wonderful. Great. Lovely. Thank you so much, everyone. So lovely to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and everybody have a great evening and maybe I'll be seeing you in some other sessions. Yes. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> um, move, start, start small. And I think you ladies have started a movement today. Really? Oh, Paula, that, that, that is a wonderful thing to say. And thank you. It for really it. is. It that. really is. I feel beautiful. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's huge. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, thank Not you. Everyone. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to meet you. Yeah.